Hey everybody, I'm Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com and this is Goulet Q&A episode number 57 on November 14th, 2014. That's kind of cool, 11, 14, 14, huh. Um, so anyway, this week is a really interesting week because we are launching a new GouletPens.com. It's been a little dramatic because We've hit some snags and bugs and things like that. As those of you who work in any type of IT or web related field, you know it's amazingly complicated and stuff can go wrong all the time. So we're starting to feel a little bit like the boy who cried wolf because we're like, hey, we're gonna launch a new site. Oh, wait, no, it's gonna be tomorrow. Hey, we're gonna launch a new site. Oh, wait, hang on. <laughs> Honestly, it's been like that for a while. Our original launch date was back in June and we kept the secret project, well, secret, for a year and a half as we were working on it because we knew things were gonna get pushed out. And so we didn't wanna continually say, hey, we got a new website coming. Oh, wait, it's delayed. Oh, wait, it's delayed. Oh, wait, it's delayed. And even though we kept it a secret as long as we possibly could stand to do, still we're having some delays and I apologize about that. But if everything goes to plan, our website will actually be down as I'm recording this q and I'm recording this on Thursday morning. Uh, and it'll publish on Friday, like it does every week. Uh, hopefully, by the time you're watching this, you'll have a new GouletPens.com to go and check out, and everything will go smoothly, and there won't be a single problem. Yeah, right, but you know, we're gonna work as aggressively as we can. We got a whole team of people that are helping us out to be doing this thing. We're not hosting the website ourselves. We have a web host enterprise level. They've got lots of very, very smart programmers that are working very hard to make sure that all of our stuff works. So I'll be doing a special video talking about the website and all that more, but just so you're aware, that's what's going on here at Goulet Pens. So it's very exciting, very dramatic, lots of craziness. So we're having to exercise our be flexible part of our core values extra hard this week. Um, so and we, we know that you're having to do that as well. So um, hopefully we'll have lots of excitement going on here very soon. But anyway, um, let's see here, what else is going on? Uh, launch a couple of new products. We got the Twisby 580, came out in a red color and a green color. Um, they'd originally kind of planned to launch that for Christmas last year, ended up getting delayed, so they kind of put it on hold and did some other projects. And they got the launch for it this time in the Christmas season. So we've got those, they're pretty neat. Um, you know, just, to, just regular 580s, but with a green and, or a red cap um, and end cap, so kind of neat if you wanna get a little different look to it there. Um, and then we got a couple of new things that we got in, but we're waiting to launch um, just because with all the craziness of the website, we figured there's enough, there's enough drama going on. We're just gonna hold off on some of these things. I'm telling you like November of this year and into early December, this is like the most new stuff and the most new kind of crazy exciting stuff that we've ever seen. It's, it's just like, I'm, I'm a pen enthusiast, a pen addict myself, and I am just like going nuts with all this new stuff. I, like I've got new stuff that I, like I haven't had a chance to do a video on the Stipula Splash yet, and that came in a couple of weeks ago. I'm still working with the Ojivas. You know, I need to do writing samples, and I wanna shoot a video to show how all the Ojiva nibs write and I haven't had the time because the website and all this other new stuff, it's been crazy. So I'm really working to try to get that stuff done. You know, just I appreciate your patience with me on getting all that because I've got a lot of things, a lot of irons in the fire and I'm working like crazy. Rachel and I are staying up till like midnight, one o'clock every night, busting it, hustling, trying to get everything so that the web launch is smooth as possible and all of these new products that we're bringing in are accurately represented and coordinated. We got a whole team here that is photographing and putting stuff in stock and taking measurements and all this, it's, it's crazy. And, and because stuff's been coming in so fast, we've all been working really hard to make sure that happens. And it's been really cool, really, really exciting. A lot of like, just, you know, just like electricity in the air around here. It's just really cool. I, I, I dig it. I feel like we're like in the zone, you know what I mean? But even still, there's a lot going on. So um, the couple of things that we have coming that we're gonna be launching uh, next week is the plan. Um, the Delta Unica, which we don't have the orange one anymore, that orange celluloid that was gorgeous. Can't get it anymore. So, um, but I really like that pen model. And so, um, you know, and, and it was pretty well received too. And uh, the price point was really good. So, you know, I think that um, it's it's something that, that you would enjoy um, just as a non-special edition pen. So they have three regular colors, a white, a blue, and a pink. 
The white pens are never usually very popular for us, so we decided not to carry that right now, but we're gonna carry the blue and the pink ones. So we've been photographing it. We actually have them, but we're not gonna sell them until next week. So just because we just wanna hold off. Um, and then another thing that we got in is Conklin. We haven't done anything with Conklin before, but they have a new pen out called the Duragraph. And it's kind of cool. It's a, um, we're selling the pen for $44. Comes with a converter. It's got a fine, a medium, or a stub nib. And, you know, it's, it's actually a really nice pen. So cartridge converter um, can't be made into an eyedropper. And I'll, I'll explain that once I do a review of that pen. But comes in three nice colors. We're actually not going to have the green for a couple of weeks. So that's part of why we're holding it off, but also because of the website. So we'll be launching that next week as well. Really like, kind of nice pen, especially for that price. So, you know, Conklin is coming out the gate with that. So that's kind of cool. Um, kind of revival of that brand over the last several years. Um, so that's really kind of neat. Um, and then kind of the last thing that we got going on is really neat. Um, we're actually, it's, it's kind of nice that um, it's working out this way, but we got the new website coming um, and it's coming within days of our fifth anniversary. So um, we consider November 17th of 2009 to be our, our anniversary of Goulet Pens in its current form. You know, the legal entity was established before that and you could consider that to be the date and I was making pens and all that before that, so you could consider that. But what we consider to really be our anniversary is the day that we got our first Execlair shipment of, you know, Clairefontaine, Rhodia, Jerbon Inc., you know, all of that. It was a very small shipment, but it was our first foray into fountain pen specific supplies. So that is what we consider to be our true anniversary because that's really kind of the heart, the meat of what we do around here. Um, so we're celebrating that. That's coming up this coming Monday. We've got a special video that we've been putting together. Super proud of Jenny. She had the whole idea and just has really coordinated a lot to get that together. It's going to be really kind of neat. Really just showcases kind of what we're all about. So um, it's going to be a kind of a different video than what we've done before. If you saw the Thanks Giveaway video that we put out, um, Jenny and Sarah and, and a bunch of people on the team here put that together into a stop motion and it came out really good just you know our team is so talented here I'm just like honored to to be leading this team and and to be a part of just watching the magic that's happening around here lately so you could see a little more of that magic on Monday when that video comes out I'm super proud of it but um, so that kind of uh, gets us up to speed for the week here. Um, so now I'll go ahead and jump into some questions. I got a whole bunch of questions. I'm getting so many good questions. It like kills me these days to not be able to answer everything for all of you, especially because like I'm working up late all hours of the night just trying to like keep the website going and I'm writing copy left and right for different parts of the new website and all that. So I haven't been like on top of comments as much as I would normally would. I haven't been able to spend as much time actually making videos and planning stuff out as I normally would like. There's just so much happening. I know you understand. I'm still working really aggressively to try and make that happen. But I always kind of like, I never feel like it's enough. That's just kind of my personality. I always want to be doing more if I see that I can. Uh, but anyway, so that kind of ties into the whole question thing. I always, I always talk too much and even now I'm cutting into my question answering time. So I'm going to stop myself and go ahead and get right into the questions. Um, so the first one I've got here is uh, at No Mercy Notices on Twitter asked, is Platinum selling separate nib units? I'd like to have their music nib on my 3776 Century, but don't want to buy another pen. Um, let's see, I'm trying to remember. I know we've special ordered nib units for Pilot. Um, I believe we can special order nib units for Platinum as well. Now this isn't just the nib, this is the whole like grip section of the pen. So it's going to be fairly pricey. It's going to cost more than half the cost of a new pen. So whether or not that's worth it to you, because then essentially you're, you're paying for most of a new pen, except you're only getting to use kind of one pen at a time. So, um, but no, Platinum does not sell kind of like just bare nibs, such as Lamy or a Pilot with their vanishing point or like that. So it, it's not as economical as those other brands, but it can be done, I believe, with most of their nib sizes. Not sure about the music nib. Honestly, I would have to check on that. But if you are interested, shoot an email to info at gouletpens.com for any like weird kind of special order questions like that. We'll always search out and kind of see what we can do. Sometimes we don't even know what we're capable of special ordering until we ask. Um, and you know, something like that might be something that we wouldn't normally be done by Platinum, but we might be able to kind of get it as a special thing. So um, that's kind of where I stand with that. Um, MLS XE Zune 
on YouTube. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Maybe there's a bit, I don't know. Um, I can't carry my Noodler's Ahab around much without getting ink all over the inside of the cap and the grip section. Do more expensive pens, specifically the Pilot Metal Falcon and the Pilot E95S, have this same problem? Um, so this is the kind of thing like some people exaggerate or not exaggerate, but have different definitions of like ink all over the inside of the cap. Like, I don't know exactly what that means to you. So, um, sometimes when you have a pen that seals really well, not really the case with the Ahab, but some of the other pens, like I know my Pilot Custom 74, I get drops of ink inside that cap all the time. You know, and it's, a, and it's an expensive pen. And uh, if you're equating like, oh, an expensive pen shouldn't do that, mm, that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes it's condensation, because ink is, you know, ink is mainly based out of water, right? And if you have a situation where the pen is really warm or just because of the surrounding environment, the ink can kind of, uh, well, condensate inside the cap of your pen and you can get little droplets or depending on how you're carrying it, if you're carrying it in, you know, nib down in the backpack or in your pocket or something like that, or if it's side to side in a purse and it's getting shaken around a lot, that can kind of force ink to come out there. So. It, it not is it's not necessarily like the pen's fault always. Certainly some pens are more affected in that way than others. And the Ahab is definitely one that has more of a tendency to do that. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with the price of the pen, it has to do with the design. So the Ahab is a flex pen. And if you pull out the nib and the feed on that pen, you'll see the feed channel is like a tunnel, you know, a tunnel, is that a big thing? No, I, I don't really know. It's like a big, gaping open wide feed because that ink, that nib needs a lot of ink when you're flexing that thing out to come through there. And it just can't do it with that narrow little channel like you might have on the Falcon or the E95S. Um, the Metal Falcon is also kind of a soft nib. It's not, not designed to be as wet, as flexible as kind of the Noodler's Ahab is. So that doesn't do it to the same degree that the Ahab does. The Ahab is kind of an extreme case in terms of ink getting into the cap. Uh, another thing that can help with the Ahab, it does have an ebonite feed. Sometimes, depending on how that thing is set in there, it could be a matter of possibly heat setting the feed to the nib a little bit closer to kind of close that gap and then it wouldn't be quite as loosey-goosey and spurting ink all, all over the place. So you can check out the Noodler's heat setting and ebonite feed video that I did back in March, I think it was, um, and, and see how to do that. It's really, really pretty simple. Basically just heat up water, put the the feed in the water and then squish it to the nib once it's kind of soft enough. So that's a pretty simple concept, but um, you know, it's definitely not like a strict correlation of price versus ink in the cap kind of thing. There's a lot of factors involved and it has to do more with kind of the design of the pen and the feed than it does anything else. Uh, Jackie M on Facebook said, is the new Noodler's Neponset as temperamental as the other Noodler's Flex pens. I got a bunch of Noodler's pen questions here, if you didn't notice. Uh, I have an Ahab and I have to give it a major overhaul every time I wanna write with it. Is there a reasonably priced modern Flex pen out there that doesn't require excessive tweaking? Um, well, okay, so the Neponset just came out. I've been playing with it a little bit and I would say, uh, yeah, it's temperamental just like the other ones. And I, I, I don't think, that it, you can necessarily blame noodlers or whatever. I mean, sure, the design of the pen is what it is, um, and it does require some tinkering, some messing around. And I think the Neponset is an interesting pen because most people with a Nib Creeper that's $14 or an Ahab that's $20 or the Conrad, whatever, you know, they're, <sighs> It's interesting, like the feedback that we get about that, some people are like, ah, oh, it's a $20 pen, whatever, you know, I'll just mess around with it and see what I can do. You know, because of the low price, some people who are kind of natural tinkerers are not afraid to mess around and heat set and screw the nib and the feed and just stuff like that and do all kinds of things with the pen. Um, because it's a low price, they're not afraid of ruining it. Other people, are, have a different view. They're like, it's a $20 pen. It's not worth my time or my trouble to mess around with it. If it doesn't work, whatever, I'm just going to throw it out. Like literally some people feel that way. And that's a valid feeling. Um, it's, it's just interesting seeing kind of like the two sides of kind of the same coin like that. So it's interesting when the um, acrylic and the ebonite Conrads started to come out, those are a $40 price, similar pen, same nib and feed, but because it's a higher price, 
it kind of raises even more to the extreme. Some people are like, this is a $40 pen, like it should just work. I shouldn't have to do anything on it and stuff like that. And you know, I understand that feeling, I really do. Other people are like, oh, it's a $40 pen, like I'm willing to invest more time, more effort. I really want this pen to work. And, and so there's that. So it's, it's kind of interesting there. I think the Neponset is an even more extreme because it's a $75 pen. So it, you're gonna get a lot more people that are like, this is a $75 pen. Like, I want this pen to work. I expect it. You know, I think the expectations are higher with a Neponset than they have been, not only because of the price, but because of their limited availability. So there is kind of like this. You know, I. You know, with ours, we sold out in 25 minutes. Um, three of their colors sold out in six minutes. So it was it was crazy. It was a feeding frenzy. So it's like those who were actually able and honored to get a Neponset at all to then like n have challenges with it working and having to adjust it and having to f screw with it. Some people are like, they just can't take it. Like, you know, cause it's just like so much built up into this pen. If there's any issues, it's a major disappointment, right? And I get it. You know, I've been messing around with my deposit and the first one that I started messing around with, you know, had some skipping and had some other kind of stuff. You know, I had to clean the ebonite feed. I had to, you know, let the ink kind of soak in it for a little while and it was getting better. I'd try out a couple different inks. I'm experimenting with it. You know, even though it's a $75 pen, you know, the pen is kind of, it's still a deal for what it is. A pen like that from another company would cost a whole lot more. Now, a lot of people would argue, you know, if it was coming from another company, the QC would be better and all this kind of stuff. And like, there's just so many viewpoints, so many vantage points around this. Um, I know, you know, part of the reason that these pens, all of, the, all of these pens in the past, and then especially with the Pont and the Ponset now, Part of the reason they are so limited is because I know Nathan Tardif has taken a lot of time and care and effort, you know, to heat set all these feeds and just like make sure that these pens are in as good a shape as possible before they go out. Even still, I know he is like crushed, like his soul is crushed when he hears like complaints about the pen because he is, he's put over four years that I've been aware anyway, into developing the music nib, into developing the Neponset as a whole. He's been talking about it for years. So the expectation is so high for these pens that like even something that would normally be kind of acceptable behavior for a pen like this, just any pen, but especially a pen that's kind of pushing some extreme kind of properties, some extreme abilities and, and things that it can do like these flex pens do, you know, um, it's 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 kind of pushing the pushing the, the limits a little bit, and whenever you're you know with great risk comes great reward kind of thing. So, you know it's it's like basically the stance that I'm kind of taking is like, I know that it's an expensive pen for seventy five dollars, and it's an expensive pen for a lot of people. And you know because it's so limited, some people may be inclined to buy this pen when normally they wouldn't want to spend that much for this type of pen. And some there's going to be a lot of disappointment. There's going to be a lot of ecstatic people. It's going to be a lot of mixed emotions going on with the Neponset. Um, so I'm I'm not going to try to like oversell this pen. Be realistic. You know this pen you're going to have to play with it. It is an experimental pen. You know, it's not necessarily your everyday writer. It's, it's, it writes pretty wet, like really wet when you, really wet when you flex it out, like unbelievably wet when you flex it out. It's gonna bleed on a lot of papers when you flex it out like that. So it's not going to be like a super versatile pen. It's going to be a tool, kind of experimental thing. So if you have that mentality about it, it's gonna be a really fun pen to play around with. If you're thinking like, I'm spending $75 on a Noodler's pen, I expect this thing to be flawless, don't buy the pen, like you really shouldn't, okay? Don't get, don't get your hopes up, don't get too excited about it um, because you're, you're building it up into something that it's, you're setting yourself up for disappointment when you do that. So it is really cool. There's a lot of people that are hyping it up and getting excited and I'm trying not to feed into the hype. In fact, I didn't even put the Noodler's uh, Neponset on our website until like a week and a half before we got it because I didn't want it to get, just run out of control. But you know you you can't help it. You know when everybody's going out there talking on FPN and all these other social channels about the pen, it's still going to be nuts. So I think now that we had an initial release of these pens, people are going to be reviewing it. I've already seen some reviews and stuff. I've, I've seen some people that are like reselling theirs because they're like, I just can't deal with it. Like I'm done. This is my last Noodler's pen. I'm sick of it. I get it, you know, it's, it's, 
it's a it's a tinkerer's pen. You know what I mean? It's like that's just that's how these things are. That's the reputation they have now, and that's kind of how it should be. Because Nathan himself, he's a tinkerer. I'm a tinkerer. I get it. Not every pen that I have works flawlessly. I have to mess around with a bunch. I have to heat set some feeds. I have to screw with some things. And um, for me, the the journey is part of the reward, right? And that's kind of how it is. So um, that's kind of where I stand with that. Um, let's see here. Oh, but you're asking, okay, sorry, I totally didn't answer most of your question. Sorry, Jackie. Um, okay, so is there a reasonably, reasonably priced modern flex pen out there that doesn't require excessive tweaking? Pretty much any flex pen, well, uh, the Noodler's pen is unique in that you can adjust and tweak it. Most of the other pens that I know that have soft or flexible nibs, there's really nothing to tweak because they kind of fix and put everything in there and lock it in so that you really can't mess with it too much. So it kind of is what it is. Um, that said, you know, you, you really don't have anything in that price range as the Noodler's pens. The next thing that I can think, well, this, you got the Platinum Cool which is not a flex pen. They don't advertise it as that. You can get some line variation out of it. That's one that I would consider kind of in that range, but it's not a Noodler's flex pen. It's a steel nib, but it's not, it's not really a flex, but that's one. Um, let's see here. What else is there? Stipula Splash. That one is a little bit temperamental as well. Um, for some people, I've heard some that have really good experiences, no problems at all. Other people have some challenges. It was interesting. I had um, you know Madigan here. She's in our customer care. She was doing the Monday matchup with the Stipula Splash. She was running into railroad issues and stuff using um, Stormy Gray, and uh, you know, and then literally same pen, same ink. Alex was using it to do some uh, Flex Nib Friday stuff on Twitter and Instagram, and. She said the thing was flawless, never had a single problem. Same pen, same ink, two different people using it, having a very different experience. So, you know, when it comes to using flex nibs, I have just learned to kind of throw most, most absolute statements out the window because there's so many variables. Like there's enough variables as it is with fountain pens when it comes to nib selection, the feed, the design, the ink choice, the environment, the relative humidity in the air can affect things, um, the paper choice, writing speed, writing pressure, pen rotation, writing angle, you know, just all these various things. Um, there's so many different variables, which for some people that's a curse because it kind of eliminates some of the absoluteness and some of the perhaps predictability when you're shopping or when you're reading reviews or something like that. You know, you might have a very different experience than somebody else who's literally using the exact same pen and ink. But um, at the same time, I think that's part of the, the um, enjoyable part if you have kind of the right mentality about it. The fountain pens, they are so very personal. So they, they really, um, they really speak to you, you know what I mean? Like me, the Pilot Custom 74, like for, for years, it's been like my, my love, my, I love that pen, just the way it writes. I don't particularly love the size necessarily or the grip or the, even the aesthetics of it is, a, is good, but it's not like my favorite. Um, but just the way that that pen feels when I, when I write with it, I just love that pen. But it's definitely not like the first pen that I recommend to people. Like the, the Pilot Vanishing Point writes similarly, but it's way more popular than the Custom 74, way more, you know? And so is the Lamy 2000 and, and other things like this. Um, Custom 74 is just, it's not that popular of a pen. It's fairly popular. And I think probably because I talk about it so much, it's even more popular um, because I'm just passionate about it. I can't help but sell it by my passion really not trying to like hard sell you on this thing. In fact, right now I'm trying to undersell you on it because it's like, I'm telling you that it's just, it's me that I love it and that's why I talk about it. But um, you know, other people feel different ways about pens that I can't stand. You know, the Lamy CP1 around here is one of the most popular pens on the Goulet Pen Company staff. I, the pen's okay, but I kind of can't stand it. It's too thin for me. I don't like the grip. You know, I respect what that pen is and I, I, I like it as a thin pen for kind of that way. But for me, like as a daily writer, like I can't stand that thing, but it's just me, you know? And I love the Lamy pens. I really do. Um, I like that same nib on lots of different other pens. I love the All Star. Not as, not as big on the Safari for me, just my thing. I like the metal, I like a little bit heavier weight. You know, it's just, it's just, there's so many different personal preferences and stuff like that. And when you throw flexibility into the mix, just forget it. Like you, you almost can't even predict how you're gonna like it until you try it, which is 
which is frustrating on some of the more expensive pens, um, like the Falcon, like the Ojiva that's, that's, come, that's come out here. It's a $500 pen with a flex nib option. You know, it's like when you're spending that much, it's hard not to build your hopes up into something ridiculous. Um, that's part of why I love the Noodler's pens so much is because they are the flex pen for the people, right? Like you can get them. And that was, that was Nathan's original vision with creating the Noodler's flex pens was he wanted the every man, the every woman to be able to experience flexibility and kind of that old world style and not leave flexibility to like these super exclusive high-end pens or um, you know not exclusive in terms of they have to be that way but or they're they're made they're intended to be that way like the Ojiva for example they just there's so much handwork that goes into that and creating a flex nib and all that it's just it takes a lot of time which makes it cost a lot of money um, Nathan Tardif like I can tell you he he's probably not making anything on these pens that he's putting out. He just like, he runs his company by his, um, what's the word? By his beliefs, you know what I mean? By his kind of, his, um, I, he's, you know, idealism, I, by his ideology, you know what I mean? Like he believes that these pens should be out there because he wants to prove that there's a demand for this type of pen so that other companies will kind of come up with flex pens, right? And just like there's a demand for flex pens and you know that and I know that and that's why I keep talking about it. I keep getting questions about it. I got like four questions in a row about flex pens this week. So it's, it's, um, that's the kind of thing. So like starting to see now other companies after a couple of years of Noodler's pens being out, starting to see other companies being like, oh, well, Stipula Splash is a good example. Oh, well, if we come out with a flex pen, you know, maybe it'll sell actually, you know, cause there's, there's economies of scale with all this stuff and flex nibs are hard to manufacture. Flex pens are hard to make, much harder than regular pens for a variety of reasons. So a lot of pen companies are hesitant to do them because they just don't believe that the demand is worth the difficulty and the price and the trade-off and all that. You know, that's where somebody like me in my position, I'm like, no, you don't understand how many people out there want flex pens. Please, 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 please make more flex pens. You know, and like the Splash and some of these other pens, like they're gonna be good, they may not be perfect, but you know what, let's keep tweaking, let's keep coming out with more, let's prove that these pens are out there and people want them, so that as kind of an industry, as a kind of a bigger picture with the pen world, we can kind of prove like, yeah, these are the kinds of things that we should be developing and bringing in to the pen world. So that's kind of like the very high-end 50,000 foot macro level that I'm looking at things. Um, however, when you break it down to like an individual pen, you just gotta kinda understand that like every pen has its quirks, its intricacies, and flex pens like this, it just it it magnifies, it it, it exponential it it what what's the word I'm trying to ex exponentialates? That's not a word at all. Uh, you know what I mean? It it increases exponentially the number of factors that can be involved in having a quote unquote reliable pen. So that being said. The, the Falcon is probably like the go-to standard, non-screw-you-up, easy-to-use flex pen. That said, we still get plenty of returns, plenty of people that have problems with Falcons because it's just the nature of flex. Whew. How's that for an answer? All right. <laughs> Vanessa S. on Facebook, what other flex pen would you recommend if Noodlers is taken out of context? Oh boy. I gotta say, Noodlers has put Okay, so Noodlers, like, I was around, not for long, but I was around before Noodlers Flex Pens were in existence. And I personally was like, just like everybody else, I was like, oh, Flex? Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Where do I find Flex Pens? And at the time, before Noodlers came around, there was the Falcon, the Namiki Falcon at that time, and there was Vintage Pens. And that was pretty much it. You had some, like, really kind of high-end pens that did, and, and like custom ground stuff, that wasn't really on my radar. That wasn't even as widely known about back then. Um, but pretty much that was it. It was like you get a Falcon for 140-ish dollars, 
or you get some vintage thing that you got to find somewhere and it might be a hundred dollars it might be a thousand dollars who the heck knows and there's not much standardization that like people call things wet noodles but what does that even mean and you know you're into kind of this whole just like vintage world and understanding the whole history of flex nibs and everything just to be able to have something you know so it was pretty much falcon that was about it for like a modern flex pin um, but uh, you know these days now you've got the nib creeper ahab conrad you know now Naponset. Um, there's you know stipula splash other company like the omas ojiva like other pen companies are starting to kind of embrace flexibility a little bit more so um, and and now that enough people are kind of familiar enough with the concept of flex and maybe have practiced and gotten the hang of things a little bit they're branching out and trying some more so that said there's still not a ton of flex nibs out there for the price of the Noodler's pens, there's really not much um, because I know that Nathan is like on a mission to get these pens out there to the world. So he's he's not, you know, he's, he's like, he's a guy, you know, and he's got people that make the different parts and stuff around the world, but he doesn't have a, you know, Noodler's is not a large company. It's Nathan, you know, that's pretty much it. So he, he, um, is really kind of just running it in a running his, and building his pens in a way that that few others would possibly be able to do. That said, you know they're not perfect. They've got their issues from time to time, but um, you know, like half the time he's out of pens. You know, but that's just that's how it goes. Um, but anyway, so for the price, I would say probably there's not much else. But you know, there's a platinum cool. Um, and the Platinum Balance, those are not advertised as flex nibs, but you can get some decent line variation on those. It's a steel nib. Um, you can do it. You know, how, how much you should do it and all that kind of stuff, I don't really know because it's not advertised. It's not necessarily designed as flex, but you can, you can, you can force it. Um, but other than that, let's see here. There's the Falcon, you know, and there's the Platinum Modern mach -E is pretty soft as well. That's a similar nib to the Cool, um, except it's gold instead of steel, so it's a little bit softer. Um, you know, the Omaso Jiva's got a, uh, a flex nib on it. We, we're carrying the 14 karat extra fine, um, but you can get it in a fine and medium flex as well. Not sure if you knew that. Um, we can special order those, but, uh, you know, um, so it's, uh, and those are, those are really soft. Those are pretty awesome, but it's 500 bucks. So you don't want to buy that thing and go flexing it out like crazy because you don't want to spring the tines and, you know, you definitely can spring the tines on a pen like that. So you gotta, you gotta be careful, you know? So... Honestly, if Noodler's pens weren't around, oh, you got the Stipula Splash. That one's a 60, we got that for 64 bucks. Um, so that one is, and is another alternative. That one though is even harder to flex uh, than the Noodler's pens. So, you know, as to whether or not that's right for you, you know, it doesn't smell like the Noodler's pens. So <laughs> that's probably the biggest plus to the Splash. Um, so really that's kind of it. So, um, you know, there's vintage options and there's other things like that. I may be missing some other pens that might be out there. That's just what's on my radar. Um, so, you know, that's, that's it. Noodlers really has kind of changed the world of flex and maybe over the years we'll see more stuff come out, but that's where we stand now. Um, at bike SC on Twitter, at some point I would like to get into Ponset. Are there going to be replacement nibs and feeds available and will other nibs fit? Um, I doubt that replacement nibs and feeds are going to be available. I'm sitting here looking at an Aponset right now. Um, you know what? I meant as I was prepping for these questions to, <laughs> to um, check and see. Um, I haven't yet tried swapping out nibs on this to see how it will perform. Um, the feed and everything appears to be the same as what's on the Conrad and the Ahab, which is a number six size nib. I am 99.9% .9 sure that's what we're dealing with on the Naponset. So I believe you can swap out a regular Noodler's non-flexible nib. I believe you could put a Noodler's regular flexible nib into it, not the music nib. Um, you could also put a Goulet nib on here. You could put a Monteverde nib. You could put an Edison nib. Um, so you've got, you've got a bunch of options as far as putting nibs in there. How well it will perform, I would expect that it would do just fine. Um, but I haven't yet tested it for myself Again, new website, craziness. Haven't been able to tweak and play with things and, and it's killing me because like the Naponset's a pen I've been waiting for for years and I just, I haven't had the time to sit down and tweak and play with it as much as I want, which, you know, that's just kind of how it goes. I have a job to do. I have, you know, you know, people whose families are depending on what's going on around here. So for things like that, I have to kind of, you know, prioritize my time, but um, that is something I definitely plan to get into a little bit more 
as I'm able. All right, um, let's see here. At C-T-R-Y-M-A-U-S, I don't know how to say that. Citrimouse, city, country, country mouse on Twitter, cool. What pens need to be pre-washed or flushed before filling to avoid skipping? That's an interesting question. Um, I'm not gonna call to specific pens necessarily. I would say anything with an ebonite feed is a good idea. Um, pens like the Noodler's pens and stuff like that. Um, ebonite is a kind of a more porous material. Um, not to mention, it's, uh, ebonite is not injection molded like most plastic feeds are on most modern pens. Um, ebonite has to be cut, which means that there's a potential for dust and debris and machining oils and stuff like that to be kind of in the, in the, the pen. So a pen like that, you'll definitely want to flush and clean out with some kind of like, you know, uh, dish soap and water or a pen flush per se. Um, so that's, all, that's never a bad idea. And honestly, it's never a bad idea to go ahead and do that for any new pen that you get in. Now, of course, this is the pot calling the kettle black. I don't always do that myself. Sometimes I'm just so excited. I can't stand, I just want to ink up the pen and I'm, and I'm like, well, I'll, I'll just ink it up and try it out. And then if I have problems with it, then I'll clean it out and do the whole thing. But I just, I can't stand it. I want to go do it now. Um, but you know, I'm sure a lot of you are like that too, but it's still, it's always a good, it's, it's a good idea to always clean out your pen before you use it for the first time. That's my official, like Mr. Instructional hat on uh, Mr. Instructional. That doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? So it's always a good idea to do that just as a common practice um, to flush out. And then of course you always want to flush and clean out any pen whenever you're changing ink colors. And then probably once a month, just as you're using the pen, even if you're using the same ink over and over again, just to clean out the paper fibers and dust and all the junk that can build up in there. Um, I've got a good video on that in my Fountain Pen 101 series, Pen Cleaning and Maintenance. Definitely check that out. All right, at Paul Joins on Twitter. I have a bottle of discontinued ink that I don't plan on opening for years. Should these be stored in the refrigerator? That is an interesting question. Um, depends on how many bottles of ink you're talking about. You might start to look like a crazy person if you're storing an entire shelf of ink in your refrigerator. It could upset your other members of your household, possibly. Um, but, uh, you know, basically when you're storing ink, the most important thing is to make sure that the cap is sealed tightly. Um, because if the cap is not sealed tightly, it doesn't really matter how it's stored, it's going to get ruined because the water is going to evaporate out of there and it's going to be a problem. Um, now, if that does happen, if the water does evaporate out, it still leaves the dye, you can, you can reconstitute the ink with, you know, distilled water if that happens, but it's, it's going to be almost impossible to get it back to exactly what it used to be. Um, so storing it in a cool, dry place is kind of the most important thing, um, but also um, storing it out of sunlight is going to be the most important. So if you're storing it, if it's just a bottle itself, you know, with no um, box or anything, keep it in a drawer or a cabinet or something like that where it's not being exposed to sunlight because sunlight breaks down dyes that are used in ink. Um, if it is in a box, you don't have to worry about that quite as much unless it's a clear box like the Schaefer boxes, you know, that you it doesn't even matter that it's in a box. You can throw that box out because it's not doing it any good in terms of storage. Um, but uh, yeah, let's see here. So specifically talking about the refrigerator, a refrigerator would keep it cool. I'm not going to say that it would probably hurt anything necessarily. I just don't know that it would particularly be worth the trouble. Um, and specifically, if you have if you have it and you're storing it, and the cap is going to, um, if it's not tightly secured on there. The refrigerator, it's cooler. There's a cooling system that's in there. Anytime you're dealing with a refrigerant system, it's going to be a drier, less humid environment than in the surrounding air, most likely, depending on where you live. Um, if that's the case, if you're dealing with a cap that's slightly loose or not secured or comes unsecured over time, then what you could deal with, if there's any way for the moisture to escape out of the ink, it's probably going to do that faster in the refrigerator than it would elsewhere. So I would say it probably doesn't really matter too much one way or another whether or not you're storing it in the refrigerator. Perhaps there's more research or experimentation that could be done on that, but I would say that, you know, if you've got the room in the refrigerator and you just wanted to put it in there and it makes you feel good, go for it. But I don't think that you have to do that. Eddie R on Facebook, have there been any products 
This is an interesting question. Have there been any products you thought you were, were going to do well at Goulet that just flopped or failed to meet the demand that you thought they would bring? Oh gosh, you know, back in the early days of the Goulet Pen Company, back when we were still in our garage for the first two years-ish, um, it wasn't quite two years we were in our garage, but close to it. Um, we did a lot of experimenting. Um, back in those days, you know, we didn't have many customers. We were talking with a lot of people on, you know, forums and blogs and stuff like that. And it was pretty much like any product that we got asked about once, we would stock it and carry it and, and tr see how it did. If we were getting a couple of questions, you know, that was about kind of a different kind of line of products, we might just kind of experimentally carry a bunch. So it, in the very, very beginning, we didn't carry much and the stuff that we were getting asked about was pretty popular and, and it was kind of more of a sure bet. Once we got to like being around for a year, a year and a half, we started to kind of get much more experimental and be like, oh, well, if people like this kind of ink, I bet they'd really love this kind, you know, or it's like people, you know, people love the different colors of ink or like people love the J. Bond inks. Maybe if we carry the J. Bond calligraphy inks, you know, it's ink is ink, you know. And we didn't know quite as much like how much of a rift there was between like you're into fountain pens, you're into calligraphy, you know. So I would throw that out there that like calligraphy products. That was something that we started out carrying very early on. Um, it's hard to say if it was a flop. It did not sell well for us because we didn't know what we were doing with calligraphy. It was not in our wheelhouse. We had some people that were asking for it, but we are carrying Browse and J. Bond calligraphy stuff. And that's like one type of calligraphy product, but there's a lot of others out there. Just like when you get into art supplies or pencils or whatever, you know, there's a lot of brands or rollerballs even, like brands that we carry currently that will make a fountain pen and also a rollerball and a pencil and things like that. Um, that is something that, you know, if we're like, oh, well, if the, you know, I'll just throw this out there. Like if the Twisby pens do really well, I bet the Twisby pencil would also do really well. And the Twisby pencil's done pretty well. I'm, I'm not ashamed of it. Um, we're still carrying it and stocking it regularly. So I'm happy with that. But as soon as we started carrying that, it was like, oh, you should carry this pencil and that pencil. This is blah, 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 blah. And then it was like, oh man. And then I found forums and all these other things and found like, blah, there's this whole world of pencils out there. I had no clue. And so we're getting asked about all these kinds of pencils. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like I'm not ready. I'm not ready to get into pencils yet because I'm not going to shotgun it. You know, I'm not just going to be like, I'll just carry a bunch of these pencils and see what sells. And then if they don't sell after 60 days, we'll just discontinue it and whatever. And just constantly pick and drop and things and change and sale and discount and move and you know, bundle together and just all these other things. And it's just constantly guessing and who knows. That's not my style. Like my style is like, I got to like get a pen and be like, all right. Let me mess with this thing. Let me see, like, what is it about this pen that's gonna be awesome? I'm very in touch with everything that's going on. I'm an enthusiast myself. So I like really think things through before I carry something, especially these days. Um, so in the earlier days, I didn't have as finely tuned of a radar. You know, I didn't have all the experience to pull from myself. So I was reading a lot and trying to figure things out. Some things would be less clear. There was a lot more experimenting going on in the early days. Um, sketchbooks are another thing that we've tried and just have never done as well as I would expect them to do. In the early days, we had carried a lot of Clairefontaine paper and Clairefontaine has a sketch pad called the Graphit. You know, a bunch of different sizes. It's nice paper, it writes great, um, but flopped. We just could not sell the stuff because there's, there's different needs that artists and sketch people, you know, sketch artists and stuff have than fountain pen people have. And we are fountain pens, you know? And uh, so we've tried other things, you know, even Stillman and Byrne, like um, we've recently, you know, stopped stocking Stillman and Byrne, not because of any harsh feelings or the quality of the product is fantastic. And I loved Stillman and Byrne. I shot videos on it and, and all that, but it just, you know, we looked at our sales and the sales have been declining. Even though our company has been growing, Stillman and Byrne has been declining. And I'm like, you know, I'm confused by it. I don't understand. I promote it. I talk about it plenty. But it's just, you know, as we're known more and more for fountain pens, you know, we're becoming known kind of less and less for things that aren't fountain pens. And I guess I'm okay with that. You know, I'm, I'd much rather go deep than go wide personally. You know, I want to be deep and into fountain pens and that's kind of my style. So, you know, things like that have, have always kind of confused me when things, especially when we get asked about it, there's a lot of paper products that we get asked about a lot 
And then when we go to stock it, it doesn't do well at all and we discontinue it. You know, we probably do more experimentation with paper than anything. Not as much in the last six or nine months because frankly, it's kind of exhausting to stock a full line of paper and take, I mean, paper takes tons of time to take pictures and do dimensions and there's all these specific details. So it's kind of disheartening when we get all excited about carrying a paper product and then it doesn't do well and then we have to discontinue it because it takes up a lot of room, it's very heavy. It's, you know, paper is, is a chore. You know, I love paper, which is why we stock as much of it as we do, but it's heartbreaking when we, when, when we get all excited about paper and we do all this stuff and then it, it just doesn't do anything. You know, and, I'm, and the paper I'm less sure about than anything else because I never really know what's gonna happen with paper. You know, but um, you know, other things like certain pens, I've been amazed by pens in the past. Um, probably the first big one was um, the, well, we, we carried some ballpoints back, way back in the day. Um, Karen Dosh, they have got a wonderful ballpoint. The 849 is their typical, like kind of standard ballpoint pen. The click is magnificent. They have a metal X pen that they have. It's like 20 bucks. It's got the Goliath refill in it that writes like a dream. Best writing ballpoint I've ever used, the, on, the only ballpoint that I will use um, is that the, the Karen Dosh with that refill in there. But we tried carrying those very early on, did terribly, could not sell those things. Oh, ha, <laughs> actually I should have thought of this. I've, I just remembered the best, the best answer to this question. Products that I thought were gonna do well that just flopped or failed to meet the demand. Um, the, be the best one, this goes back to before we even did fountain pens. The best one would have been, um, I did licensed Virginia Tech products. My wife and I, we are, went to Virginia Tech a little Virginia Tech thing up there. Um, we both graduated from Virginia Tech and I was so excited when I was making pens to do like a maroon and orange pen or do a nice pen out of wood, engrave it with the official Virginia Tech logo with a case with Virginia Tech on it. You know, we paid out the butt to license Virginia Tech stuff in at a time when we could not afford it. Um, we really got our hopes up about licensing Virginia Tech stuff. We're like, wow, we're two Hokies. We've got a great story. We're going to do that. I, we were making, I was, you know, custom uh, making wine bottle stoppers and engraving them with a Virginia Tech logo. I used to do people's monograms for weddings and stuff like that um, for, into these wine bottle stoppers. Very, very neat kind of stuff. And um, probably the biggest, you know, I've talked before about like how I wasn't able to sell my own pens very well. Well, <laughs> I had my pens, I had my Virginia Tech licensed pens and licensed Virginia Tech wine bottle stoppers. We went to a Virginia Tech wine festival housed on campus, like with the Alumni Association and everything. We had a tent set up there with Virginia Tech pens and wine bottle stoppers at Virginia Tech, at the Virginia Tech Wine Festival, did not sell one. Not a single product. Not even a wine bottle stopper. And it was reasonably priced. It was like 30 bucks or something, you know, for a, a nice like Coca Bolo wood or like an Amboina Burl wood wine bottle stopper. You know, it's like I could not give the freaking things away. And that was just like the most endlessly frustrating thing because every single friend and family member that I had said, this is the best idea. You guys are gonna do so great. I'm so proud of you. Your quality is amazing, blah, 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 blah. And nobody ever freaking bought them. So you just never know sometimes. Part of that, like you can tell that feeling is still like very raw inside of me. Part of that is just like, you know, you never really know in business what's gonna happen. That's why like, I don't make a lot of assumptions these days. Like even still with a pen like the Neponset or whatever that seems like a sure thing that's just gonna sell out immediately and whatever, I'm still like, I remember what it was like to like drive hundreds of miles and set up at a wine festival and get my hopes up and do all the right promotion and build quality products and prepare for months to build up the inventory to go to something like the Virginia Tech Wine Festival and then just fall flat on my face and flop and fail and spend more money in food that I would sell at an entire craft show. And like, th that is all still like very fresh in my memory. So I know how hard business is sometimes. And I just, I don't take it for granted. You know, I, I work as aggressively as I do and spend time doing videos and stuff like this because I am appreciative of the position that I'm in, the success of this company and all that, like I appreciate it because I know it is not a guarantee. It is not a surefire thing. And I know that every single day, I gotta bring the thunder as Gary Vaynerchuk would call it. And I gotta do 
you know, bring value to you and to your life and to, you know, basically just live up to my maximum expectations every day because every day is a gift. That's just my feelings about it. So I'll leave it at that because I can't end a question any better in that way. Uh, Michael K on Facebook asked, does the Pilot Custom 74 and the Pilot Custom Heritage 92 have the same nib? Yes. Yes, it does. Very simple answer. Same nib, both pens. They both write great. The only difference is the pens is the aesthetic stuff and the fact the Custom Heritage 92 is a piston instead of a cartridge converter. It's a lot more expensive. It's like 70 bucks more to get that feature, but for some people it's worth it. The Custom Heritage 92 is not a very popular pen. It's really not. It's a great pen, but it's a little pricey for what you're getting. So you got to really kind of want that piston. But it, it's a it's a it's a beautiful pen. It writes every bit as good as a Custom 74. So I like it, but I don't talk about it as much because it's not as good a value. But it's a fantastic pen. Chad C on Facebook. In a recent video, many Goulet fans had gotten a small look behind the curtain with the glimpse of what the rest of your office looks like. I can't speak for others, but that small reveal left me wanting to see more of the Goulet offices. Are there any plans to make a video giving a tour of the Goulet headquarters? P.S. When Santa asked me what I want for Christmas this year, I'll be wishing for a tour video. <laughs> so, okay, so we've been like posting a lot more stuff on Instagram and stuff like that of just like pics of us around the office and stuff. And, and so you've gotten glimpses, but I know <laughs> I know you can't really get a concept of what it's like for us around here working, um, especially because honestly, like even when I give a physical tour, it's a bit of a rat's nest around here. And it's and that's not just because we're like cluttered and like stuff like that. It's, it's, it's just because of the layout of the building that we're in, you know, the nature of how we grew into the building we're in. So it's a it's a large building. The whole thing, there's actually six separate buildings that are all connected and we occupy three of them. So we're about half the, the building altogether, about 12,000 square feet here. Um, that did not start out that way. We started out, moved out of our house into a 3,000 square foot. And then we swapped with the people on the end of the building because they were downsizing, we were upsizing, we got 6,000 square feet. And then what happened is every 6,000 square foot block in our building is separated by cinder block walls. So um, we had to get our landlord to punch through cinder block walls to take over another 3,000 square feet to make it about 9,000 later on as we were growing. And then the other tenants next door moved out and we just figured what the heck, well, I'm sure we'll need it. So we got it and I'm glad we did because we definitely use it now um, to connect. So we had to punch more doors and stuff like that. So it's now 12,000 square feet, but it's technically three separate buildings. We have three separate addresses, three separate electrical panels. <laughs> it's really kind of bizarre. And uh, you know, when we've had to reroute all of our own ethernet cables and stuff like that and phone lines and whatnot, just because, you know, we've got like one kind of central comp closet with a switch and all that stuff, but like all of the e ethernet and everything running through is in three separate buildings, you know, it's all separate. So it's, it's really kind of crazy in this space. And it's on two separate levels too. So like our warehouse area where we're pulling all the products is like three feet higher than where we're actually checking and packing everything. So it's, uh, we have like a little ramp that we had to build that we like slide things down, you know, because it's just, it, we've had to adapt quite heavily to our area here. Not to mention as we've grown, we've shifted things around. We've moved offices so many times. So honestly, like part of the reason I haven't done a tour video yet is because if I did a tour video like three months later, it would be different, you know, but I'm sure at least you'd still appreciate the insight. So we're a little more stable now than we have been in the past. We're always still kind of moving things around and, and hiring, hiring folks and, and kind of continuing to expand and grow. But even still, like, I think that, uh, I think that a tour video has definitely been something on my mind. You know, I don't want to, Part of me is like, I want to show that stuff to you. Part of me is like, you know, it's my livelihood here. I don't want to like, basically like show you how to, you know, come in and rob me kind of thing, you know? So it's like, I want to be, I want to be smart about how I do it. I don't want to like show some of the proprietary things that have taken us years to build and develop around here. I don't want to just like showing that to everybody, but I'm sure, you know, like everybody kind of feels that way who shows stuff, but there's probably aspects of what we do um, that, that are more, worth keeping close to my chest. Other things are probably not that important. So I've, I haven't like sat down and really thought through like my own feelings about kind of all that and, and what I would want to show and what I wouldn't and all that. So, um, you know, I've, I've been a little more secretive in the past just because like, 
it's been blood, sweat, and tears to get to this point to where we are. And, and um, so I've probably just unreasonably kind of not wanted to share it in a way. Um, so I, I think I will be more open to doing that in the future. You know, I showed my office here a couple of weeks ago. Part of it too is I'm, I'm a bit of a pack rat. I'm kind of, I'm not that neat. So it's kind of messy in my office, you know, and there's parts of our building here that frankly are kind of a little messy and they don't look so pretty and you just wouldn't be that impressed if you saw them. But you know what, it's real, it's authentic. This is kind of how we are. I'm a messy person. It's funny if you ever look like, <laughs> like I'll show you right now, just a perfect example. While, while we're talking about it, like my desk, like you see my background looks kind of neat and all that, but uh, let me see here. But if you look like right down here, just outside of the frame, like look at all this junk that I've got. Label maker, I've got remotes, I've got, you know, cleaning cloths and stuff like that. You know, if you look over here, like my desk over there, like most of the time I don't even sit at my actual desk just like we're getting new phone systems installed. So I've got a phone, but it's kind of like sitting on a pile of papers. It's just messy, you know what I mean? Like I, my life is a little messy. You know, I try to clean things up as much as I can, but uh, you know, it's not perfect. So a part of it is I just haven't wanted to show that. Whoops, I gotta flip my viewfinder around, hang on. Yep. Okay, my battery's gonna die here soon anyway, but. Anyway, so that's kind of where it is. I think definitely I'm going to look to do something like that. Just, you know, matter of putting it together is with everything else that's been going on. But, you know, I think that would be kind of cool. I'm, I'm, I'm more open to that now than I've ever been. All right, at Gozes on Twitter, will you consider offering the Goulet nib in soft? Um, I would consider it, but Yovo does not make a soft or a flexible nib. Um, I'm not even sure how I would get that done. I would have to source it out from some other nib supplier, which means a whole other thing. Um, and so it's not something that I can do. It's probably not realistic ever to do offer any kind of economical thing. I mean, especially because like the Noodlers flexible nib now is available for a couple of bucks. You know, I can't do better than that. I just can't. So that's what I would say. And it's the same size too. It's a number six nib. So it's, I, I would not get your hopes up about that probably happening ever, but definitely not anytime soon. All right, at Lucy Honeychurch on Twitter, have Clairefontaine paper with Sayez ruling, but the lines are very dominant. Are there other companies that sell Sayez ruling? Um, Sayez, also known as French rule paper, it is. It's like there's lines everywhere. You can go back and look at my video on it. Ah, that video is so old and I'm like embarrassed by it almost, but you know, it was the best that I could do at the time. And it's still better than pretty much any other video I've seen on Sayez paper. So it's not like, I, I, I show what I think is how to use that paper. It's really not super proper or anything like that. Basically, French roll paper, it's like, it's what the kids use in French schools to, you know, learn how to write handwriting, basically. So it's kind of like the, in, in America, we use like the, in, in the US, we use like the lined, like the solid line and then the dotted line and then solid line and all that. And it's like really fat and it kind of teaches you how to write letters and how big to make the loops and all that kind of stuff. Um, for those kids that even learn how to write anymore. But, um, you know, that's kind of what it is in France. So uh, I'm not aware of any other French rule paper that you can even get in the US, like period. Um, but I'm sure just like there's lots of different types of that dotted and dash paper in the US, I'm sure that there's other companies that make that French rule paper. I have no idea who does or what it might look like. Maybe there's some with less, less bold lines I'm not aware of any though. I admit it's a, lot of, it's a lot of lines on the page. It is very dominant, but I'm not aware of anything better. However, if you wanted to, you could always um, take a say as ruling and put it behind a blank sheet of paper. That way, as you're practicing, not only would it make it look less dominant, but then when you're done using it, you would look like you had the most amazingly straight and consistent handwriting ever on a blank piece of paper. So that would be my recommendation. Give that a shot and see, see what you think. All right, last question I have. Uh, Mary B on Facebook, you have such a luscious cornucopia of inks, but since I'm a writer who doesn't traffic in shading or art, what inks should I steer clear of or doesn't it matter? I would say it really doesn't matter. Like honestly, just experiment. I use all different kinds of inks. I'm like you, I don't really draw or do much like watercolor or anything like that. It's just for writing. So for me, I just, I get samples, I load up the inks in my pens, I get colors that I think I'll like, and I just see what looks good to me. So that's it for this week. Um, my question of the week in the comments, assuming the website is going up before 
or maybe not before, but you know, maybe you could come back to this question after this video is posted. Whenever the new GouletPens.com site comes up, let me know what do you think of GouletPens.com? What's the good stuff? What's the bad stuff? We're actually setting up a web address, um, website at GouletPens.com that you can email with any bugs and stuff to report. But I would just love to know in the comments what you think about the new site. That's all for this week. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend and a great rest of the week. Thanks for hanging out with me on the Goulet Q&A here. I'm gonna be back next week just asking open forum questions again. Thank you. I'm gonna get back to checking on how the website's doing. <laughs> have a great week and right on. <laughs>